Uh, Madam, I think we can start. So let me introduce. So good morning to all. Uh, welcome to the Silver Lu Silver Jubilee Lecture Series of the International School of Photonics, Kusat. And uh, this is our very first talk, and we are honored to have a Professor Kyoko Nasaki from University of Tokyo here with us. Uh, let me welcome the Director of International School of Photonics, Professor Dr. Pramod Gobinath, to introduce the speaker. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Praveen. Um, I think um, a very warm good morning to all of you. We at the International School of Photonics, Kochi University of Science and Technology, are very happy to invite all of you to the Silver Jubilee Lecture Series. As the name suggests, the International School of Photonics has completed 25 glorious years of academic and research excellence. And as a part of celebrating it, we have organized a series of lectures by veteran scientists all over the globe, showcasing state-of-the-art research in potential streams of optics and photonics. We are extremely privileged and honored to be beginning this Silver Jubilee Lecture Series with the esteemed presence of the most distinguished professor and scientist from the field of organic chemistry, Professor Kyoko Nozaki from the University of Tokyo, leading a dynamic group in organic chemistry, the main research interests of which lie in discovering, developing, and understanding new reactions mediated by homogeneous catalysis for organic and polymer synthesis. The key areas of research interest of the Nozaki group also extend to catalytic transformations, functional polymer synthesis, synthesis of aromatic compounds, and heterogeneous catalysis. Professor Kyoko has been awarded the Home Course Prize in Organometallic Chemistry in 2004, Wiley Award in 2008, Saru Hashi Prize in 2008, Mukiyama Award of the Society of Synthetic Organic Chemistry Japan, Catalysis Science Award 2009, Nagoya Silver Medal, 2013, Schlenk Lecture Award, and a lot of other awards too. Professor Kyoko is delivering a talk on synthesis and properties of heterohelicines. Once again, on behalf of all of us at International School of Photonics, QSAT, I welcome you, ma'am, to deliver the talk. I also welcome all the participants to the first webinar series. Thank you. Thank you Over very much. Yeah, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. It's truly my honor and pleasure to uh, start this very prestigious um, lecture series. And as um, the chair kindly introduced, my research topic, um, my research area now is not exactly photonics. Actually, when I got invitation, uh, when I first met Dr. Pravin, who organized this conference, it was um, 2016, a meeting for CO2 utilization. And he was interested in our work that CO2 and hydrogen to produce uh, formic acid. Formic acid is a main um, content of ants acid, but whatever, we were we are working on iridium catalyst and how the organometallics work uh, for catalysis is my interest and it was Dr. Pravin's interest at that time. And then I got invitation from him, and would you like to give a talk? And I said, well, sure, why not? And then what he said is, uh, since the specialization of the department is photonics. Any topic related to uh, spectroscopy would be appreciated. And he said, what, I, I'm, I'm synthetic organic chemist and I'm working on catalysis, but as it's such a great honor and opportunity, I will do my best to um, focus on this type of area. So as you can see, um, this is the homepage of our, uh, this is the website of our um, research. And um, 
So if you're interested in, you can visit this um, website later on to see what we are doing, like homogeneous catalysis for catalytic transformation, like CO2 utilization or to make polymers or to utilize biomass, so on and so on. And today I decided to select this talk that is um, synthesis and properties of aromatic compounds, because I thought this would best fit to um, the audience interest. I just, um, okay, so let me move on to the, my topic. I will focus on helicin synthesis. What is helicin? Helicin is a molecule shown here that forms a helical form. This part is coming up to front, up to front. Uh, we draw like this in organic chemistry. And this part is buried behind so that this structure, this structure is not planar, it's helical. So I just briefly mentioned about its synthesis and then we'll go forward for its uh, absorption and emission properties, which is very much related to photonics. And also go forward for chiroptical properties for some molecules. Helical structure is uh, everywhere like DNA, double helical structure, or a peptide forms helical structure, or sugars, like um, starch also form helical structure. So there, there are so many helical structures. And I think helicin is one of the most simple helical uh, organic molecule. As you can see, benzene brings are fused to minimum six of them. So the terminal position over here, the CHCH, and this terminal position, CHCH, cannot overlap. So it forms helical structure. Helicin has chirality, so-called minus and plus. M stands for minus, P stands for plus. And plus means the right-handed screw and minus means um, anti-clockwise screw. And um, the properties, and as you can think of, it's curl. Curl means uh, handedness. That two mirror images do not overlap each other. And it's chiral, it shows um, in absorption, either left-handed or right-handed light get absorbed more than the other, or in emission, either left-handed or right-handed light emits more. In addition to the classical all carbon helical molecules, here in this presentation, I would like to focus on heterohelicin. Hetero means something else. And in our study, we put heteroatom over here, represented as a star, to somewhere around here, so that the properties can be changed varied based on the heteroatoms we introduce over here. Helicin has been known since 1950s. It's really an old chemistry. And in addition to all carbon helicins, it's been known like the oxygen can be incorporated or the sulfur atoms, oxygen. Any uh, various kinds of heteroatoms have been incorporated into the helical structure. In the synthesis, this uh, sulfur containing part are combined to give helical structure. Our approach started 
from this chemistry. That is, we happened to find synthetic pathway to close up here the two carbons with hydroatoms. The two carbons over here and here existed in bisphenol. Three benzene rings bound to another three benzene rings, and here are two hydroxy groups, phenols, and we could connect between these two. Let me start from oxygen and nitrogen. The first report, synthetic report, appeared from a group in 2005, already 16 years ago. This is a very simple natural product synthesis. And, and here, the benzene OH and benzene OH was transferred to a triflate and then closed up to nitrogen. This moiety is called pyrrole. And when we were making this natural product using our palladium catalyst, our interest was this palladium catalyzed reaction. Then we found that instead of simply phenol, when we have three units over here and the three units behind, we can close this carbon and this carbon with the nitrogen so that this molecule can become helical. Also, we could make this helical molecule not by nitrogen, but oxygen bound. The structure is so cool. This is single crystal X-ray analysis of this helical molecule having oxygen right here. As you can see the packing, this helical unit is stacking to the next one and the next one. So it's really like a spring structure. It was very nice to see this lovely packing. And, um, but when we have nitrogen, the nitrogen had phenyl group, that's benzene ring over here. So we, uh, the packing was not as nice as the oxygen one. It was, it's a bit more complicated packing structure. Anyway, uh, currently this is still ongoing project, but we are interested in single molecule um, property of this helicin molecule and we are collaborating with Dr. Kumagai in Fritz Haber Institute in Berlin to measure single molecule property. Like we are spreading the molecule onto um, the surface, like a silver 111 surface uh, to see very beautiful STM image. Actually, as you can see over here, there are a pair of compound um, nicely arranged. And here in this area, the picture is a bit hazy. So we think this um, twin structure is coming from the two helical molecule. And this hazy area is coming from the benzene ring over here and here, which is perpendicular to the surface. We want to measure a uh, single molecule uh, like conductivity or Raman spectrum. And that's uh, what we are currently fighting against. Let me move to the next element that is phosphorus. Again, starting from this three plus three unit triflate, we could close it to phosphol, that is a five-membered ring having a phosphorus in it. Unfortunately, this phosphol is very, very uh, sensitive to oxygen. So we decided to work on phosphol oxide instead of phosphol itself. 
here the phosphorus atom is um, valency is three. Well, this is five valent, um, pentavalent phosphorus atom, phosphine oxide. Also, we could convert this oxygen to sulfur. So these are the molecules we uh, enjoyed our chemistry. As you can see here, um, the oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphooxide. These are um, shown here are the absorption and emission spectra. As you can see, there is clear um, difference. I mean, you can see um, for oxygen and nitrogen that we could see very clear fluorescence. On the other hand, and absorption spectra, uh, the absorption edge was 388, 400, 390, about the same. But for the emission, um, oxygen and nitrogen showed fluorescence, for, uh, 399, 419. But for this phosphooxide, the, there was a significant stroke shift, large red shift took place. So that, um, yeah, this is the stroke shift. So something strange is going on at the excited state in this phosphooxide. So we further went forward for uh, DFT calculation. This is not the excited state. This is simply the um, calculation for HOMO and the LOMO level. It's already nine years ago, so the calculation was not that high in level. But um, anyway, the HOMO is simply located in the same way as uh, for nitrogen, but in LUMO, for phosphooxide, we did detect that there is something special going on this phosphooxide. That is, for this phosphorus oxygen bond, there is a huge sigma star orbital. And for PC bond, again, there is a big uh, sigma star orbital. And these two sigma star orbitals delocalized to the dying moiety, that's here, the, the beauty dying moiety, and the terminal carbon, phosphorus, and the sigma star, and this carbon, pi star. Pi star, sigma star, pi star does have delocalization so that this lumo is very much stabilized. And this was the trick why we got so much uh, huge stock shift. But more interestingly than simple absorption and emission, and this is my favorite um, picture, that's crystal packing. This is a schematic drawing of the X-ray single crystal structure. As you can see, uh, this is the helical moiety of this molecule and benzene ring over here and phosphosulfide. The dipole moment is drawn here, and this vector is divided into um, perpendicular to the helical structure and parallel to the helical structure. As you can see, uh, there is a canceling of this dipole moment. One molecule directs in this way, and the next one directs in this way, so that this parallel vectors get canceled to each other one after another. On the other hand, in this column, the dipole is uh, directed into one direction. Naturally, the neighboring column have this direction, dipole, so that the neighboring two columns cancel to each other. That's really usual 
to cancel all the dipole to get packed crystal structure. However, what interested me is this column consists of only plus isomer, that's the helical structures clockwise, while this column consists of the minus isomer, the anti-clockwise helical structure. So this purple and blue are mirror image to each other and they never overlap, so they are different molecules. Interestingly, all columns having this direction dipole had clockwise plus helicity, while this column, all of these dipoles consisted of anti-clockwise um, structure. So if you, um, we, we are very much interested in the structure and it could be applied for uh, non-linearity, but other than that, if you have any sort of uh, interest or application of this type of molecule, I would be very happy to collaborate with you. This is one way for plus isomer, and this is the other way around for the minus isomer and these two are mirror images to each other. Okay. Um, this is my group photo. It's so unfortunate that our group photo is not usual. I mean, usually we have a group photo um, everybody together, but unfortunately, um, this time we can have only this type of photo. Uh, by the way, um, let's see, I sent you the home page of our um, website, our website information just to give you um, image if you're interested in. Anyway, let me go back to my presentation. So, okay. Um, so far, oops. As for this heterohelicin, I talked about um, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. The rest of my presentation will be focused on carbon, silicon, and ruthenium. Silicon and carbon. When we bridged the two carbon atoms with the CH2 or SI dimethyl, C dimethyl, C diphenyl, we saw um, about this very much similar absorption over here. And it's quite different from helicin molecule, that is this carbon version. So when this is all carbon conjugated, the absorption and the emission are much uh, longer um, redshifted. It's because of this conjugation and the um, emission, I mean, quantum yield is quite low. On the other hand, when this conjugation is um, cut, is not when it's disconnected by carbon or silicon, sp3 atoms, we did see a very high quantum yield and very strong emission, especially in case of dimethyl silylene we did see very bright blue fluorescence of, um, even in solid state. So we hope that we can find some sort of application of this um, silicon containing material utilizing this very strong blue light emission. Owing to the helical structure, 
we can also detect uh, chiroptical properties. That is, the red and the blue over here are CD spectrum. That is uh, to differentiate um, right-handed and left-handed um, light absorption. And shown here are the emission spectrum. And for emission, we also saw that the silicon containing material, which shows very strong emission, does have preference of either right-handed or left-handed light emission. The G values, uh, that's to evaluate the degree of um, handedness is not extremely high yet, but uh, we were very happy to see this very strong emission together with reasonable G values. We also made double helicine. Actually, the synthesis was very difficult and the key for our success was we could transfer the bromide to dilithiated compound. With this dilithiated aryl compound, we could put one, two, three, four nucleophiles onto silicon tetrachloride. Fortunately, we could get tetraarylation of silicon and could get this double helicin, bridged by silicon. Actually, it turned out to be this is the first spiral. Spiral means the two rings are um, connected by the sp3 structure. We could make this spiral um, double helicin, not the conventional double helicin. Means conventional double helicin always are connected by the conjugated structure. That means the dipole of the two helicins are parallel to each other. On the other hand, luckily as we could connect them by spiral structure, the two dipoles are perpendicular to each other. And I will explain a little bit about what we obtained with this um, perpendicular arrangement. Compared to monohelicin, the double helicin showed um, much longer in um, absorption. That means uh, the absorption get um, red shifted and emission too. We did see lovely fluorescence, but I would like to, uh, so the red shifts in absorption and the fluorescence. I'm delighted to explain why we could get this um, red shift in the double helicin compared to monohelicin because there is no conjugation. The two helical structures are perpendicular to each other. So there is no conjugation, seemingly. No pi conjugation, but silicon contributed to connect these two helical structures. The first silo is famous of um, low lumen. Let me explain what the low lumen means. Silo, silicon containing pentad ion structure, can be divided into butyl ion and silicon moiety. The orbital of a butyl ion, the lumen orbital of a butyl ion, is drawn like this. Here is a node. Here is another node. So. Uh, um, this is the pi star orbital of butadiene. And for silicon moiety, carbon silicon sigma bond has sigma star orbital located over here. For this carbon silicon bond, the sigma star is located over here. And they, when these two are combined, we can have this, um, oops, sorry. Uh, we, we have a lumen orbital where this blue part 
and the red parts have conjugation and this white part and these two white part has conjugation to lower the lumo. This is so-called pi star sigma star conjugation. As you can see, the sigma star and pi star, sigma star and pi star are conjugating to each other. The white part sigma star, pi star, pi star are conjugating to each other. In addition, when the silos are found in the spiral structure, this part is conjugated, as I mentioned previously, sigma star pi star. On this part, again, the sigma star pi star uh, conjugation does take place. But these are perpendicular to each other. And there, it could have been perpendicular means no further conjugation. However, uh, luckily, due to helical structure, we did see the delocalization. Let me explain. So like I said, uh, when the silo unit has perfectly perpendicular structure, then um, the orbitals are not overlapping at all. However, because the helical structure twists the silicon, so it's not perfectly perpendicular. It's a bit twisted. And because of this twist around the silicon, if you are looking, uh, we, we are looking the structure from this direction. And these two orbitals are in front and these two orbitals are at the top and at the bottom. And you can, as you can see, because of this twist originating from this uh, steric demand of helical structure, the two are close to each other and these two are close to each other. And when these two can overlap, it, lowerize, it stabilizes the unoccupied molecule or, uh, orbital, while the other one has uh, the opposite um, sign, so it's destabilized. And this is the reason for further stabilization of the lumo orbital to cause redshift of the helical structure. We call it spiral conjugation, and we were very happy that we could see the spiral conjugation in the spiral st structure. Um, and we did see chiroptical properties too. Let me um, finish my talk um, by explaining about our carbon ruthenium chemistry. It means uh, the main structure itself is carbon. But when this proton is abstracted, this five member drink becomes anion minus one carbon anion and it get bound onto ruthenium. The ruthenium is sandwiched with the two helical, uh, two um, carbon planes. It's called metallocene. There is a report having this metallocene type um, structure but only one, two, three, four, five was reported, but no report for the seven rings. And as five is too short, the ring can flip each other and it cannot be a stable helicin. But as we have more, we have a seven, this structure is a very stable helical structure. We could even make double helicins bound by metal. So this carbon metal bond is really flexible. Two helix can rotate around ruthenium. So it's, um, it's bound onto the metal, but the rotation is really free. 
and we can have plus plus or minus minus or plus minus. Fortunately, we could separate all these plus plus and minus minus and plus minus. Um, yeah, I, I like this structure, ruthenium abound. So ruthenium purple is underneath here and this helix and this helix are connected at the central position and it can just rotate around. When we, instead of having two helices on one ruthenium, when we added two equivalent of ruthenium to one helicin, we could see another compound. That is one ruthenium is bound underneath this helical structure and the other ruthenium is bound on above the helical structure. So two rutheniums are bound on two one helicin. This is five membered ring, this is a six membered ring, but nevertheless, ruthenium are bound on here and here. Um, interest, interestingly, we found there is a metal to ligand, a metal to ligand metal charge transfer in excitation. As you can see, this is the um, S0, that's the ground state. And upon a excitation, the singlet state is made of the ruthenium and uh, the, so, okay, so the uh, ground state is located on this part on this ruthenium. But upon excitation, um, the electron get excited to the ligand part plus the metal orbital. So this is from metal to ligand metal orbital charge transfer, electron excitation. That means this bottom ruthenium is the electron donor and the top ruthenium is the electron acceptor. Interestingly, we detected phosphorescence, not a simple um, phosphor, not a simple fluorescence, but we detected phosphorescence of this molecule, both in solution and in solid state. So um, the T1 was calculated to be over here and it came down to S0. That means coming from this metal center back to this metal center. So upon excitation, it goes, the electron moves from this ruthenium to here and uh, in emission, the electron comes back from this ruthenium to this ruthenium. We are not the only ones um, working on multi-metallic helical molecules. So if you are interested in, you are guided to see the publication from Katz and the Castle and Mizuri. And there are even more publications uh, working um, in being interested in physical properties of the double helicins. Okay, so that's all what I wanted to share with you. And uh, these are the people um, I um, deeply appreciate. And uh, if you have never come to Tokyo, uh, please do so once you can travel easily, not at this, this time probably, but hopefully soon. It's a big city, yes, but there are many lovely places to visit. And also our university, uh, this is the main clock tower and this is our building. We also have a beautiful campus, including um, very much historical uh, places like the Red Gate and the lovely Japanese style um, garden. So all of you are welcome. And um, finally, um, thank you very much for the invitation again and thank you for listening. Hello, madam. Yes. Hope you Thank enjoyed. you very much for the wonderful talk.
Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. And uh, I have a couple of questions on the chat box and let me read it. And before that, I have a personal question. Um, yes. In the monohelicine studies that you reported in the very last about uh, coupling ruthenium, mm -hmm. so is there any study on coupling iridium instead of ruthenium? Uh, we made only ruthenium and iron, but have never worked on iridium yet. Um, the valency is a bit different. Okay, okay. So ruthenium and iron two we could work on, but I, uh, iridium either mm -hmm. one or three, it's still ongoing. But yes, of course, iridium is the most uh, oh. popular metal for phosphorescence. That's true. Yes, yes, yes. So then, so I, one more question, and you put your um, uh, heterocidicine on uh, silver um, one 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 surface. Is there any reason for the choice to put the molecule on the silver atom? Um, we tried gold, silver, and copper, and turned out to be silver was the best one to hold our um, helical molecule. Okay. Anything related to the lattice um, lattice parameter of uh, silver or? Um, I, actually, I am not the specialist, and just my uh, our collaborator selected I it, and I, I, yeah, I know that my student visited Germany to try everything, and he could get it. That's all I know. Ah, okay, Sorry okay, for okay. that. Uh, no, no, that's okay. just just out of curiosity because we also worked mm -hmm. on uh, silver one 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 surface. Okay. So and mm -hmm. there were and there were a couple of questions on the chat box and let me read okay. one by one and if you you, you maybe you could comment on it. And um, one student asked, "Is uh, what are the applications of uh, circularly polarized fluorescence that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk?" Right, right, yeah. right. So CPL people say that CPL can have further information so instead of like color you can have one additional information depending on plus or minus to like when you print uh, bills i mean notes money yes um, yep. if you use this color it's obvious that uh under certain detection you can see whether this note is real or not but i i don't know exactly whether this is really applicable or not but this is what i heard so, um the answer is okay. there is one more information when it's yes. printed okay thank you and uh, one another question is there any non-linear optical studies that you have done uh, on these molecules uh no not yet the phosphooxide, which arranges nicely one um, the parallel anti-parallel columnar structure, um, we tried to collaborate with um, physicists, but their request was first grow at least three millimeter cubic um, crystal, and this was the bottleneck, mm -hmm. we could not grow our crystal that large. So still um, not, not yet. Okay, fine. Uh, and also you were, speak, uh, you were speaking about the effect of phosphorus. I mean, you noticed a uh, stock shift. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. And uh, did you notice this kind of effect in uh, double helicines as well? Um, Yes, so like I said, the phosphooxide has the sigma star orbital of carbon phosphorus and oxygen phosphorus. So uh, the same mm -hmm. thing happens for car uh, carbon silicon in silo. So in this silicon and phosphorus, we did see the sigma star, pi star conjugation, and it contributed a lot to lower the lumo for the redshift, yes. Okay, okay, okay. And also one very general question. Um, yes. So I'll read the question. In photonics, we may do some experiments related to disensitized solar cells. So for which we need to select the matching of homo lumo band gap. So before experiments, how can we select this matching? 
is there any criteria other than theoretical predictions in a theoretical prediction um no theoretical uh, uh, yes other than theoretical prediction do you have any options to predict uh, through experimental guess i mean the hormone lumen levels okay okay um so when the molecules are main group molecules mm -hmm. recently theoretical prediction is getting a reasonable uh, result but this is most no, but, but this is mostly um, the homolumo for grand state for excited I state yes, i think yes. for excited state i think the um, thread, theoretical approach is not as good as for the grand state and um, one of my student uh, is trying to apply machine learning yes yes so that's what just, i would think yeah he just collected um when, when he had to stay because of covid he just mm -hmm. uh, get connected to all the literature to dig I the see. data yes, yes. and went for uh, machine learning and it thinks like seems like it's working very really well yes it's quite powerful yes yes yeah, Indeed, yes 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 and what about the stability of these molecules actually the... um most of the molecules are stable at least even the ruthenium one we mm -hmm. it depends on what the definition of stable but even the ruthenium one we could vaporize for chemical deposition onto the surface so it's yeah. it's reasonably unstable i think i see okay so uh, those were the questions and mm -hmm. I would like to thank you once again for sparing some time for us. And thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So thank I'll you get, so much. I'll, I'll tell the, the, yeah, I'll tell the participants to contact you if they have any specific queries later sure, to talk sure, later sure. on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just visit our homepage yeah. and my um, email address is. Sure. Too. Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Bye -bye. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.